before the break, we uh, talked about the general mechanism of G proteins and the steroid hormones. But what I don't like about those figures is they don't teach you specific physiology that's important for this class. So what I want to do is, with these two hormones, ADH and aldosterone, they're each an example of a protein hormone and a steroid hormone. That's a protein. That's a steroid. And this is physiology you do need to know for the exam. So I thought I'd go through that now. Starting with ADH. We're clearly bored. <clears throat> All right, so um, now this figure isn't from the textbook, but um, there's figures like it in the textbook. What I, what I like about it is, um, it looks these steps here. I put this in, this picture is a little inset I put from your textbook. And the first thing about physiology I want you to understand is, what imbalance are you correcting? In this case, for ADH, which stands for anti-diuretic Hormone. The name is descriptive. <clears throat> In physiology, a diuretic increases your urine output. Increases your urine output. So what do you think an anti-diuretic does? Decreases it. Decreases it, yeah. And so the, this imbalance that you're correcting for is dehydration. Maybe low sodium, primarily brain as a mechanism to detect that. Um, for example, when you're dehydrated, the saltiness of the blood increases. And so in biology, saltiness is called osmolarity, like molarity, but osmolarity because of osmosis, the, the diffusion of water. So I just abbreviate that OSM. If you increase the saltiness of the blood, um, there's a gland called the posterior pituitary that will secrete ADH. An alternate name on this slide, they use vasopressin. In physiology, pressin always means an increase in blood pressure. So let's think for a second. Let's think about blood pressure. When you're dehydrated, you've lost fluids somehow. Some way. So you may have lost blood volume. Loss of blood volume. Which will lead to a loss of blood pressure. BP. So that's the physiology, the, the chain of events. You're dehydrated, you can assume. Maybe BP is, has dropped a little bit. Now, blood pressure is the pressure of the blood pushing against the vessel wall, and that is pushing blood forward to your vital organs. So when you're dehydrated and you've lost blood volume, you lose some pressure, okay? Um, and so this will correct that. Antidiuretic, you decrease your urine output, which is good because you don't want to lose fluids to the urine. You'll increase your blood pressure. So what you see here is, step one, vasopressin binds to the membrane receptor there, and that's, that's right there. So you have a cell, and it's presenting a cell mem uh, a membrane receptor, a hormone receptor, on the cell surface. And then vasopressin from the blood
I'll say ADH, same thing, right? It's going to bind its receptor on the cell surface there, so I'll just kind of fill it in there. Okay, this is the kidney. The kidney regulates fluid balance levels, so this cell, think of it as a kidney cell. So the first thing we know is that ADH secreted from the posterior pituitary targets the kidney. So um, <coughs> the pituitary is excuse me, in your brain. The kidneys are by your 12th rib back here. Anyways, you bind it at the receptor. So number one, ADH binds receptor on cell surface. And we talked about G proteins before the break. They, they don't go through the whole cascade. They skip to the important part. Step, step two, increase second messenger. Okay. I'll just kind of paraphrase and say increase up arrow cyclic AMP. That's our second messenger. Now in this specific action here, the cell in response to the second messenger signal, these aquaporins will insert these water pores on the other side of the cell side opposite. This side is facing the lumen, the lumen of where fluids are flowing through the kidney. You want to take all the water out of, out of there so you don't lose it to the urine. So this first, third step is crucial. Step three, in response to the cyclic AMP, you insert <clears throat> aquaporins. Now there's different ones. There's like one, two, three, four. This is aquaporin number two. It's abbreviated AQP2. Okay, insert aquaporins, I'll say in luminal membrane. Because it's on this side here, this is the luminal side. So I'll, I'll label this lumen. And how they illustrate it is, they have these little water pores in, in, the, in, the, in this vesicle here. And, but they're just hanging out in the center of the cell. So the AQP2, I'm going to draw an arrow, it's that little double line thing there. Okay. And what, what it does is, they do you no good hanging out in the middle of the cell. In response to cyclic AMP, <clears throat> you mobilize these to insert that little double line, which is, represents the pore, into the membrane right there. So you go from hanging out in the middle to you insert it right there. There's AQ. E2, it's right there. Now you can kind of take up water. And as you know, water, they follow the rules of osmosis. Okay, so this says 300 milliosmol. This says 600, 600, 700. 300. This is 600. Uh, inside the blood, they say that it's 700. Well, anyways, water goes to where the most stuff is to try to like balance out the concentrations, right? Those are the rules of osmosis. So water, a little water molecule, it can go inside the cell through the aquaporin, and it can even go out the other side. Assume there's aquaporins on the other side as well. <clears throat> and that's basically what I want you to know. Water ends up inside the blood vessels. So what, how we say that is, water is reabsorbed. <clears throat> I'll say water reabsorption. via osmosis. <clears throat> the thing I'll add 
That's not really indicated on the slide, but it's implied, I'll, I'll expressly state it. You increase blood volume, increase blood pressure. Therefore, you correct the dehydration. Increase blood volume, therefore increase blood pressure, BP. That's the end of it. <clears throat> so there's a lot of details there. I'm just kind of following the figure. Uh, do you have any questions on uh, these steps or what I drew there? Yeah. So C A M P activates. Um the lumen's feet on the kidney cell, and that's what opens up the AQP2? Yeah, the AQP2 is put on this luminal side in response to the cyclic AMP. So does it take it off those and put it over there, or it just makes one? Oh, it doesn't make one. It just takes these, which are hanging out in the center, inactive, and pushes them over. Okay, that's kind of what it, what it is. Any other questions? So um, put a star next to this, this is really important. I always look for this on exams. Does the student understand the basic physiology? If you increase the blood volume by water reabsorption, you increase the blood pressure. Does that make intuitive sense to you? Increase the fluid in the tube, you increase the pressure that the fluid can provide and, and push blood forward. Okay, what do I say? I want to move on from this one. I want to talk about another hormone that's related to ADH because it also increases blood volume, blood pressure, but in a different way. This hormone is aldosterone. This is why it's good to go over your notes right after class, these kinds of processes. Um, if you try to do it tomorrow, you'll have forgotten everything. It's good to rewrite your notes right, right after class. All right, so for this one, if you have, um, again, if you're dehydrated. What I didn't mention before, you also have lost a lot of electrolytes, like sodium. <clears throat> sodium, A plus. Sodium, they always use sodium with Na because there's a word called natriuresis. In physiology, that means Electrolytes that can increase blood pressure. Okay, a little light like sodium. But anyways, we call it sodium it's, um, as it carries a full positive charge. When you're low in sodium because of dehydration, there's another hormone that comes from the adrenal cortex. I'll teach that later. But anyways, that picture of it's right here. It's on top of the kidney. A little gland on top of the kidney called the adrenal gland. <clears throat> so in this, if this is the imbalance your body needs to correct, the physiology is, The adrenal cortex will secrete, among other things, aldosterone. Now, aldosterone is a steroid. So in our kidney cell, our kidney, again, is the target for aldosterone. They illustrate aldosterone as these little, little yellow balls. I, I have <clears throat> orange. Okay, now <clears throat> the little orange balls are binding their receptor inside the cytoplasm. So here's the nuke. <clears throat> I don't want to try to draw every detail, but um, there's the aldosterone receptor drawn inside the cell. It's not on the cell membrane because this is a steroid. It can diffuse through 
can bind its receptor inside there. And I think that's all the detail I want to draw. There's too much else, so it's really messy. But the point is, by binding in the cytoplasm, aldosterone, binds, let's call it a cytoplasmic receptor, initiate transcription. Uh, number three, you're going to do translation. You're going to make new pumps. <clears throat> so step three, transcription. Um, I'm sorry, step two, transcription. Step three, translation. Maybe make new pumps or there were pumps already there, let's just get them going again. That's step four. They say, I say it differently, they say aldosterone induced proteins <clears throat> modify existing proteins. That's a confusing way of saying you're just kind of like getting the pumps already there working again. I'll say turn on existing pumps. Aldosterone's doing all of this. Now, so these pumps are ones that will help the cell reabsorb sodium and secrete potassium, although I'm not concerned you know that second part. I'm concerned that you remember you reabsorb sodium. So pretend sodium is here on the filtrate side. So on this side of the cell in the illustration, that's the filtrate. The filtrate is being modified by the kidney cells. And when it's done modifying the filtrate, that's urine. Okay, filtrate is basically your blood plasma that has been filtered by the kidney into this space here. And you filter all kinds of small molecules like water and like sodium. And if you don't want to lose it to the urine, it's the job of the kidney with the help of these hormones to reabsorb it back into the blood. So you're going to get some new pumps here. I'm just going to draw a green ball that goes straight into the cell, past the cell, into the blood vessel right here. <clears throat> so we're on step five. I'll draw it over here. Reabsorb sodium. And the other thing is, when you reabsorb sodium, water tends to follow it. Pretend sodium, it has a full positive charge. For it to be soluble in water, it needs to be surrounded by water. <clears throat> so when you take a sodium molecule, usually water follows. That's kind of the rule I teach. You see it in books all over the place. And if water follows, you increase the blood volume and the blood pressure. <clears throat> and so therefore, you've corrected your imbalance. So whenever you go through these processes, wherever you end, we ended right here and right here. You always go back and look at the um, imbalance that you were trying to correct. You know, just make sure you talk about it correctly in your studies. But I do want to move on unless there's some questions about either ADH or aldosterone. Next topic. All right, so. Um,
the first picture I showed you this morning was uh, <clears throat> this picture here, right, to find endocrine. And the question mark is, well, what stimulates this gland to secrete things in the first place? And I already gave you one example, dehydration. That could be an imbalance that triggers it. To generalize, there's three categories that your book outlines. Uh, you can stimulate your endocrine glands to secrete things, either by something that's in the blood, some blood level, humoral, neural, or hormonal. Okay, and those are the three things that we like to go through. Uh, for example, that's based on this figure from the textbook, the Marriott text, and they give students examples of here's here's um, endocrine glands. There's two of them right there. There's the thyroid and the parathyroid. Well, anyways, in the first category, start to study the different blood levels that can go out of whack that will stimulate an endocrine gland. And when I say out of whack, I mean a level can get too low or a level can get too high. So to introduce the concept, let's go through a few examples of where the level is too low. So call this uh, a humoral stimulus of blood of endocrine glands. All right, so here's a blood vessel, and let's say you have, I won't start with the example they have on there. I just did one. Let me just start with that. What if you have a low level of sodium? That is a direct stimulus on the endocrine gland. Maybe, um, well, not maybe, I just told you. The adrenal cortex is responsive to that. And what, had, what I had said was is that you secrete the hormone aldosterone. And we just talked about the physiology, that, that targets the kidney and eventually Whenever you're studying an imbalance is, the end result is the reverse. Increase sodium. Okay, there's other examples. Um, this morning I gave the example, uh, well I didn't give the example, you did it on your app sheet. Like what if you have low glucose? If you have low glucose, the gland that was stimulated that you should have wrote is the pancreas. The hormone that's stimulated to be secreted is glucagon. And that will help increase blood sugar. This example, I think it's a calcium. Low calcium in the bloodstream. There's these parathyroid glands. This is in the neck region. Those create a hormone called parathyroid hormone, PTH. So let me get this here. Low calcium in the bloodstream. That'll stimulate the parathyroid gland. I haven't taught the anatomy of that gland yet, but just to give you a preview, the thyroid is basically your voice box. The parathyroid is kind of behind it. So you're in the anterior neck region. Neck. So you have some idea. And that gland, in response to low calcium, will secrete PTH. And based on how I'm teaching, what's the uh, response you expect? Increase calcium levels. So the body regulates blood levels of certain things through these hormones. And the direct stimulus is the blood level, um, in this example, becoming too low. Okay, so that's one mechanism. Now in the middle frame, you have one example of a neurostimulation of a gland. So 
So let me, uh, I want to clear this out. So now, if you study the picture, uh, I don't know if you remember studying your autonomics, but that, those are preganglionic sympathetic fibers, and they have a straight shot to the adrenal medulla. So imagine, um, well, I'll just write the term sympathetic preganglionics. You have to go back and look at the autonomic nervous system to remind yourself what that is. Go ahead and do it. But basically, that's a stress response, right? So this is like in, in response to some remarkable stress. You see a dog running at you, you know, <clears throat> or something. Well, anyways, those nerve fibers directly stimulate adrenal medulla. We talked about the adrenal, cor the, the adrenal gland already. It's right on top of the kidney. If you cut the gland in half, what you'll see is that there's an inside and an outside. The inside part is always called medulla. In anatomy, medulla means pith. Pithy, it's deep inside. This inner part, that's medulla. So I'll put an M. But all around it is C, cortex. I said that aldosterone is from the cortex, but the medulla, that's, that's kind of a short-term stress response. In response to that, you'll secrete, I'll just put E and NE for short. If you're curious, that stands for epinephrine, norepinephrine, that's a fight or flight response. Those are called catecholamines. So let me write that down. E and NE are. Catecholamines. The E stands for epinephrine. And the NE is norepinephrine. Those are the two principal uh, catecholamines. They used to be called adrenaline and noradrenaline, but we still call it the adrenal gland. Okay. And that's the one example of a neuron fiber stimulating a, gr a gland directly, okay? <clears throat> um, the last example, and this kind of leads into my uh, next set of slides, is this right there, where you have hormones controlling the release of other hormones. Now that whole idea is um, you're going to be studying, these, these are called tropic hormones. Tropic spell tropic. Now, the tropic hormones um, are an example of hormonal stimulus. Tropic, spelled tropic. A tropic hormone um, controls the release of another hormone. It can stimulate its release or inhibit its release. It controls it. It's a controlling, it's a regulatory hormone. So I'm going to write all that down. Controls the release. another hormone. I mostly call them tropic hormones. You can also call them uh, regulatory hormones. They, they might even go by some other names that I, I can't remember right now. If you come across, let me know. But mostly we call them 
that. And so the, the concept is, at least on the figure they show you, they show you up top, I'll put HYP for hypothalamus in the brain, right? And right below that is a gland called the anterior pituitary. I'll say ant pit for short. And they even put other endocrine glands downstream of that. So all of these things can release hormone sets that control the release of other hormones from these other places. Um, so some other gland, which will secrete some other hormone. Okay, but if you start at the top, for example, I mean, you don't know this yet. I'm, I'm going to go through each gland in detail, but just to kind of introduce the concept. The hypothalamus can secrete a hormone called, um, I'll just give you the abbreviation for now, CRH, just write that down. That stands for, um, <clears throat> actually, let's go with TRH first, since that's the first one listed. I'm going to change that C to a T, sorry about that. Okay, so that stands for thyrotropin releasing hormone. I'll write it out later. But anyways, the point is it's from the hypothalamus. It'll travel a short distance to the anterior pituitary, and in response to that, cells will release um, TSH, which stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. So that will travel to your neck where the thyroid gland is. And in response to that, the thyroid will release thyroid hormone. So in review, let's put check marks next to all of the tropic hormones. TRH, um, I don't know my caps are flying all over the place today. TRH, let me pose this as a question to you. Is this tropic? That's a yes, no question. Yes, why? It's controlling the release of the next one. So check. TSH, hmm, is that tropic? The answer is yes, it controls the release of that hormone. Tropic, check. TH, that's at the end. It's not tropic, but I'll, I'll tell you its function later. It'll help boost metabolism, but it's not controlling the release of another hormone. Okay. And so the, in the middle example, they have the adrenal cortex, so I'll just already pencil that in right here. If you're under some kind of stress, part of the stress response, the hypothalamus will release the CRH. That stands for cort corticotropin releasing hormone. Again, we'll write them out later. CRH for now. In the anterior pituitary, it'll be stimulated to be, um, it'll be stimulated by CRH, and it'll be stimulated to release ACTH. And ACTH, which stands for adrenal corticotropic hormone, that will stimulate the adrenal cortex in your stress response to, there's all these corticosteroids that are released, and the one I mentioned today, aldosterone. <clears throat> so again, to go back and take a checklist, things. The first two are tropic. The last one, aldosterone, is not because it actually does the physiology. It targets the kidney to reabsorb sodium. That's what we talked about earlier. But so this whole, whole idea is, it looks like you see a pattern, right? The top two are tropic. Well, let's do the last one. The last one, eventually you want to turn on the gonad. So ovaries or testes, they, they picture a testes there. Testes, the male gonad. And um, well, I think most people know already, testosterone is the major sex hormone. But what you may have not known, it actually starts the hypothalamus to turn it on. So there's a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone. G small n RH, and that'll target the anterior pituitary. Your gonadotropins are called FSHLH, two of them. 
These are collectively your gonadotropins. Okay, so for right, there's some details here, but for right now, just know that the gonadotropins target the testes to release testosterone. Okay. So you can, again, can consider all of these top levels. Boom, 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 those are all tropic. They're controlling the release, uh, ultimately, of testosterone. So on your half sheet, let's take a minute to process this. Read these examples. It's one, two, three, four. So somehow on your half sheet, because the other one I think was also one, two, three, four. Um, title it something different so I can tell which one it is, but I should be able to tell based on your answer. So again, do this one, two, three, four on half sheet. You can write it on the back, that's totally fine. So these four examples, put it on your half sheet. <clears throat> All right, just to check in, what did you put for the last one? You want to shout out? Uh, did you put hormonal? Yeah. yeah, okay, so maybe you are on the right track. I, I want to um, start the next batch of slides called pituitary. We have about 20 minutes left. I don't want to fall too far behind the first week. I kind of know where I kind of have to be to be on track for Wednesday. And so now that we've gone through the basic physiology of hormones, I can start to go through the details of each individual gland and all the hormones and all the physiology, now that we've talked about the general principles of the endocrine system. And we'll start with pituitary, and from here on out, the second batch of slides, third batch of slides, I'm just going through all the slides there. So, um, pituitary. Embryology is taught only when I feel it helps students um, understand the adult form. And this is one of those times. I don't really teach emb embryology too much in this class. So what we see here in a three-week um, embryo is a little upgrowth and downgrowth in where the brain region is going to be. So if you focus here, we've got this kind of upgrowth and this downgrowth. Okay, if that makes any sense. Well, anyways, the upgrowth, uh, what they call a hypothesial pouch, that is your future anterior pituitary. And that little downgrowth in week three of development, that's your future, uh, future posterior pituitary.
Fast forward to adult, those two fuse together to form one gland called the pituitary. Uh, so I have some pictures here. That picture on the left, I give you the page number. These are from the Atlas of Anatomy, the Gilroy thing I was telling you about. There, if you want to look it up. But anyways, I see a little structure there, and I point to with the red arrow. That that is the pituitary. Okay. And this picture here is the cranial base. That is where the pituitary lies. Lies in the cell of Tursica. Remember that's sphenoid. Sphenoid bone. Well, anyways, give the page numbers, you can go look that stuff up. You should know that that's the anatomy. That's where this gland is located. Okay. So what I did was I zoomed in on this side of the picture just to orient you. Uh, got your brain stem, medulla, pons, that's the pituitary, that's the thalamus, that's the intermediate mass of the thalamus, there's the hypothalamus. You can see they gray, they gray out the tissue because it's continuous with the posterior pituitary. Now if you look at this picture right next to it, it's reversed. So that's why I put the numbers one, two, three, four, so students can identify the different regions. So let's just go through the parts first. There's these four parts. The main parts are the anterior posterior, but they have different names too, so let me teach those. <clears throat> the pituitary is also called the hypothesis. That means to grow under. It's literally underneath the hypothalamus. So hypothesis is an alternate name. Know that there's different parts of the pituitary. So what I call anterior lobe, I usually call anterior pituitary. Now there's alternate names. Sometimes it's called the pars distalis. if you ever see that term. I usually just call it anterior pituitary. Okay. Then you have the posterior lobe. Or posterior pituitary. That's also called the pars nervosa. Now, to relate these two terms to hypothesis, sometimes they call anterior pituitary a dental hypothesis. Um, sometimes they call a posterior pituitary neurohypothesis. So I'm big on what it's also known as, so you can kind of recognize anything that you see as you come across it in your studies. So all of those names are acceptable for number one and number two. Now, look at the stain on the histology slide. Let's look at clues and how you can identify it. Because, you know, what if it's flipped from here to here? Number two, uh, it stains lighter in a histology stain. That, that's, that's one clue. <clears throat> I guess a clue for post or for the anterior is it stains dark. That number one region is the darkest staining region. So I'll put that as a side note: stains <coughs> dark. They have a lot of secretions. I'll go through them next time. I just want to learn the parts. There's a connecting stock number three. That's called pituitary stock, or as it says on the slide, infundibulum. Now, as you can see, the number three in fundibulum, it's continuous and leads right to the posterior lobe. So they're kind of one and the same. So here's the number three. <clears throat> okay. 
it's just a connecting stock. There's no secretion from there that I'm aware of, but <clears throat> there are axons that run through there that go straight from the brain to the posterior lobe, but we'll talk about that more on uh, Wednesday. Number four, pars intermedia. If there's another name, I don't, I don't know it. That's the only one I know it. It's the intermediate range, range and it kind of stays intermediate in between light and dark. Although on this slide, can't tell that. So it's the number four region there. I just kind of put a number four. I don't think they tried to illustrate it, but it's right in between the two. What I did on the following slide, um, this is a picture that I took from the camera. And I put the brackets next to the region you're supposed to identify. This little strip up here is the infundibulum. If you cut off center, it is not continuous. Okay? This one was continuous. They cut right down the middle. So that is infundibulum, posterior lobe, anterior lobe, lightest, darkest, and this is in between. In between. The white space is nothing, it's artifact. Okay, but the, that, the staining is the easiest clue to tell what it is. Um, I think I'll stop there, and uh, I'll dismiss class. And uh, remember, let's, let's come Wednesday, and I'm happy you, you all are here, and leave your half sheet right by the door in a pile, and I, I will collect that and enter some points for you today. Thanks. See you Wednesday.